Hey guys, Woodruff here. Let's talk about everyone's favorite topic, diarrhea. So diarrhea is something that happens. Most of us kind of like nausea, vomiting, have experienced diarrhea sometime in our life. And if you want to say, uh, actually, I've always had soft warm stools. I guarantee you when you were a baby, at some point you had diarrhea. So don't try to consider yourself just blessed and that you've never had diarrhea. Now, if you've never been blessed as an adult to have diarrhea, bully to you. I'm um, I'm very glad if you have wonderful bowel health and um, haven't enjoyed nachos to a certain extent, but most people have experienced diarrhea or get diarrhea now and again. And um, just like with nausea, vomiting, there's a variety of things that can lead to diarrhea. Um, to actually, there, believe it or not, there are there is criteria to have diarrhea. To have diarrhea, you have to have at least three loose or liquid stools a day. Um, diarrhea can be acute um, or it could be chronic. Usually it's a result of infection, but other things that can cause are going to be things like um, drugs. Certain drugs can cause um, more liquid stools, uh, food intolerances. Is that a word? Intolerances? Maybe. I would, it sounds kind of right. Um, and then GI disorders. I'm um, like, we're going to talk about stuff like inflammatory bowel. Come on, Jesus. Let's go. So um, what are our priority assessments or expected findings for this patient now? Um, hopefully I don't have to explain this too much, but a client with diarrhea would have large volume, very watery stools. They may also have some symptoms with that, like cramping. Um, they can have nausea, vomiting that comes with that and fevers. This is sometimes when we talk about stuff going out both ends. That's more, we're going to talk about gastroenteritis too. That's kind of more, um, you know, that textbook like stuff coming out both ends. Um, but just because someone's having diarrhea, diarrhea doesn't mean that they can't also have upper GI symptoms too. So because they are losing fluid and electrolytes just with, with nausea, I'm going to assess for fluid and electrolyte imbalances. I also want to assess for stool uh, and bowel habits and patterns, um, kind of see, you know, what their normal stools and stuff look like um, and how that, um, this, what might be different for them because, you know, everyone's a little bit different in their patterns and habits. I want to assess for a uh, diet um, that their normal diet is, if there is any, um, you know, changes or differences or kind of what their normal fluid and fiber intake is, um, because that can definitely have an effect or cause diarrhea. I want to assess for any other abdominal symptoms and um, like, you know, kind of do a general abdo uh, abdomen assessment, like, you know, assessing for bowel sounds, um, assessing for the contour, assessing um, palpating and seeing um, what their abdomen feels like. And then also assessing the rectal area um, for, you know, signs of hemorrhoids or, and I know you're thinking, well, hemorrhoids, isn't that constipation, but just kind of looking in general, seeing what's going on. Um, cause the one thing about diarrhea that a lot of people don't consider is, is that diarrhea sometimes can be the result of an impaction. Um, and so what happens there is, is that like, think of like a hard wall of stool forms in your ano rectal anal rectal, yeah, I'm saying that right, anal rectal area. Um, and so think of like the Great Wall of China um, in your rectal area. And then um, liquid stool will seep around that sometimes like, you know, like everything's backing up, but sometimes a little part of the wall will break down from the pressure and just like liquid stool will seep around it. Um, just so much fun. And so anyway, um, yeah, then you also want to look for skin complications because if they're having diarrhea, they can have skin breakdown. So what diagnostic tests do we need to do for this patient? Um, the main thing we do, of course, is look at symptoms and see what they're experiencing. We also want to, because um, I said infection was the most common cause, want to do a stool culture and see if there's anything growing. Um, remember, there's a high amount of people that when they have diarrhea, it's a result of they have C. diff or C. difficile. Um, which is that um, infection that you get as a result of too many good antibiotics or um, too, uh, sorry, uh, the antibiotics taking away your good bacteria and um, leaving you with a new infection. Um, and then OVA and parasites, because sometimes um, there can be uh, a lot of people have parasites in their um, intestinal tract that they don't even know exist. You may be infested and not know it. Um, hopefully you can sleep well at night knowing there might be something inside, but if it makes you feel better, uh, what do you call it? Um, there's a, 
you know, a, a lot of these things you may never know about and uh, never have to experience. But um, yeah, don't drive yourself crazy going and getting your stool tested to see what's inside because you might not like what you find. Anyway, we also want to check maybe a CBC W white, uh, w white blood cell, <laughs> white blood cell count to check for, um, you know, any signs that your body, like, you know, it's one thing for, you know, you can have a positive culture and stuff like that, but how's your body handling the infection? Um, is it like, is it on defense? Does it using a lot of its white blood cells? And we're also going to look for dehydration, um, look at altered kidney function <clears throat> because <laughs> remember, I think I brought this up in other videos, like with nausea, vomiting, where, um, sometimes, um, with dehydration, like a good way to know like that a patient has dehydration is that the kidneys got their feelings hurt. So they can have, um, uh, you know, like, a, a impaired kidney function or your creatinine and BUN can be elevated. Um, and that can be a sign because your kidneys, if they're not getting flow, they get offended. And then as a result, they, um, start to shut down. So usually they're very easily affected. So if your kidney levels are um, increased, a lot of times it can kind of tell a doctor, ding, 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 like there's some sort of dehydration going on most likely. And it's not to say that that's the only reason, because there's lots of reasons for your kidney function to go up, but they kind of correlate these together. I also want to look at your electrolytes. Remember we poop potassium. We also um, poop base. So if I'm losing a lot of base, then all I'm left with is acid. So this is where we have our metabolic acidosis. So um, metabolic acidosis comes out my ass. So a client with diarrhea is going to be better if they're having less episodes of diarrhea. Um, if their stool is becoming more formed, they are experiencing less or no other symptoms. Um, and they're not experiencing any complications where, of course, um, if they're having more episodes of diarrhea, um, their stools are more loose rather than um, becoming more formed. If they're having uh, increased other symptoms like cramping or any sort of complications like fluid and electrolyte imbalances, like think the dehydration and dysrhythmias, um, the acid base imbalances, signs of any worsening infection, um, you know, some of that systemic infection and things like that, um, inadequate nutrition or signs of malnourishment or skin complications as well. And that would be like looking for skin breakdown. So medically, we usually um, treat diarrhea. Um, you know, we can do, we, there are some medicines that are needed. Keep in mind, it kind of depends on the cause. Um, there's medications that can treat the actual problem. Like if I have an infectious diarrhea problem, you know, if it's viral, there's not usually a lot I can do about it. And sometimes it's just self-limiting. We got to literally get it out. There's a bunch of junk in me, infection in me. I got to get it out. And the only way to get it out is through pooping. It can be uncomfortable, but you know, I become best friends with the toilet. Um, and I'm not saying I, cause I started talking about me and I'm like, I really should not refer cause it makes probably sounds like I have all these problems and I don't, um, I have diarrhea sometimes. I'm not saying that, but what I mean is, is that I'm not speaking from personal experience or something right now. So let me more so word it. If a patient, um, is, um, you know, suffering from in sort of infectious diarrhea, like the best thing they can do is become best friends with their toilet and, um, get all that stuff out. Cause we don't want to keep infection inside. Um, but, um, like I said, the hard thing is, is sometimes when it is infectious and all we can do is just, they have to go, go, go and get it out. Um, but we just want to support them in that. Um, we can't decrease some of the bad bacteria with things like probiotics. It helps to build up the good bacteria or what we call good flora, um, in our stomach or intestinal tract. Um, if it's not an infectious cause, um, we can use medications to slow things down. And so most people know about things like Pepto-Bismol or Imodium. There's also some stronger stuff like Lamodal. And I'm saying all the, the easy names. Remember, you need to know the hard, long names. Um, blame Canada. And um, if it is like a actual bacteria, we can use some antibiotics. Uh, and then, of course, fluid and electrolyte replacement would be a treatment as well. It's not treating the diarrhea, but it's treating the complication. So let's talk about um, anti-diarrheals. So all of these medications are effective if there's less diarrhea um, and um, they all work uh, in a variety of different ways, um, but we just want to consider some of the possible issues that we could have with these meds. So first, um, with the Pepto-Bismol, it has actually some subsalicylate, however you say that, um, and it, which is an aspirin product. So we are concerned about aspirin toxicity or too much aspirin. So you do not want to take too much of these. Sometimes people can drink Pepto like it's their, um, like they're drinking a bottle of water. So they'll just want to be cautious with that. Um, 
I like that. Not for those with. <laughs> um, I think it's supposed to be not for those with GI bleeding. Um, and um, because it can definitely lead to um it can make things worse. Um, and then we want to watch out because this is an aspirin product, we also want to watch out for ototoxicity. Uh, there, there is also Lamotil. This one is actually has an opioid in it. And so we're concerned about dependence, um, where they can actually get like the, because the other, the opioid effect um, can cause them to like, almost like crave or have an addiction to this. Um, and then we have to think about if it's an opioid in it, um, that it also could lead to symptoms like decreased mental status, respiratory rate, that kind of stuff too. Um, it also has atropine in it, which is an anticholinergic, so it can lead to a lot of dryness. So um, it can lead to dry mouth, blurred vision, um, urinary retention, stuff like that. So we need to look for those kind of complications. Uh, last but not least, there's Imodium or Loperamide. There's less of a chance with the dependence with this one, um, but we do need to avoid alcohol. It's not for those with GI bleeding, and it can make them drowsy, so we need to be cautious. So Pepto is probably the most, the least invasive one, um, the best option, but just caution with some of the aspirin issues. All right, so here is a drag and drop for diarrhea. Um, so, and I say drag and drop, cause I, if you're sitting there and be like, how do I drag and drop this? And it's just blank on the screen. The reason I made these drag and drops is just because a officially a select all that apply is supposed to be no more than five and a drag and drop is going to be anything more than five, but I think it's good to get practice with these. So just roll with me and, um, you know, this, this, you can literally, if you want to kind of try to pretend to drag it, um, or circle it, circle and drop. So anyway, um, cause really, if you think about it, a drag and drop is just an extended select all that apply. So, um, what intervention should I include in my plan of care for a client with diarrhea? Should I monitor their urine output closely? So at first you might be sitting there like, no, well, this is a bowel problem, but what can losing a lot of stool also cause? It can cause you to lose a lot of fluid. If I'm losing a lot of fluid, I can end up having kidney issues. And what do we say is a good way to tell if my kidneys are working or if I'm hydrated? It's urine output. So this is a good thing that I definitely want to have as one of my interventions. Limit fluid intake to decrease diarrhea. Hmm. So this is saying maybe if I'm drinking too much fluid, that's why my stool is looser. And that's a good thought, but actually this is going to make things worse. I need to actually replace fluids or make sure they get enough fluid back because they can be dehydrated from the fluid loss in their liquid stool. So this is going to be an eh. Regular skin checks. Well, with diarrhea, they can have skin breakdown or skin irritation. So I think this is a good thing to do. Regular skin checks is muy bueno. Um, <coughs> apply barrier cream with each stool. Well, this is something that supports their skin health and the barrier cream can help with some of the caustic stuff that's coming out with their diarrhea. So I think that's good. Encourage a low fiber diet. Um, so some people might say like, yeah, this sounds good because if they're having diarrhea, low fiber is going to be very helpful for them. But here's the thing, fiber, it, it does help. It does increase sometimes the amount of stool you're having, but more so it bulks the stool. It makes it thicker and less liquid. So fiber is actually a good thing. We want, if we have more fiber, we can have less diarrhea because everything's more bulked up and less liquid. So um, this is a no, I, it's the opposite. I want to encourage a high fiber diet. BMP daily. So the basic metabolic panel, this is where we check our kidney function. This is where we check our electrolytes. This is something that can tell me a lot about fluid and electrolyte balance. So I think it's a good thing to include. And then pain medications as prescribed. <clears throat> so diarrhea is not usually something that causes pain. So um, yes, I mean, but it, like when I think about like what's going to be my daily care for a patient with diarrhea, I'm not like, ooh, pain meds. Like, you know, it's not the first thing I think. So I think I'm going to be more focused on urine output, um, skin checks, barrier cream, BMP to check food and electrolytes. I think those are going to be my major interventions for a patient with diarrhea. I don't like the oxygen question from before on the other PowerPoint where I was like, hey, it's not that oxygen isn't used. Um, and like oxygen can be for most patients, just like pain management can be for any patient. But I'm not necessarily thinking like, oh, a part main part of diarrhea is pain. So as the nurse, what do I do to help this patient? I want to support good hydration and nutrition. I want to monitor for complications. Um, like we talked about the fluid and electrolyte imbalances, they're probably going to need ECG monitoring, especially if they have any sort of imbalances and doing regular electrolyte checks. I need to do strict intake and output because I need to know how much losses that they're occurring um, 
incur incurring maybe incurring um so that if we can replace whatever they're losing so sometimes if someone's having like great losses we might want to replace those fluids or other things lost um and then also i want to monitor their urine output closely to make sure that their kidneys are working like they're supposed to i want to provide for safety because sometimes when they got to go they got to go so um, frequent bathroom visits lead to maybe bed alarms safety socks fall precautions all the stuff um, I want to tell them to avoid irritants and uh, make considerations in their diet for what might be helping or hurting them. <laughs> Sorry, it's water time. And like I mentioned, increase their fiber because fiber bulks things up and then monitor their skin uh, closely and use that barrier cream. Now let's talk about C. diff. So C. diff is um, a specific um, type of diarrhea that we've talked about that and more likely you like if you when you think C. diff, you should think, hey, this person just finished some antibiotics and now they're having diarrhea like that should ding, ding, ding. Like that's probably C. diff. Um, other people that can get C. diff are those are those that are oh, I was like, let me get some water because otherwise I'm going to die. All right. All right. As my voice gives out. Um, are those that are immunocompromised or on chemo and cancer patients. So patient is going to, if they have C. diff, they're going to be placed in what's called special contact isolation. So it's special because there are certain things that are needed in order to um, kill um, C. diff bacteria. Like it can stay on surfaces and objects for up to 70 days. So instead of using the typical purple wipes or gray wipes, whatever you have at your hospital, we usually have to use, um, uh, well, not usually, we have to use bleach. It's the only thing that will kill it. Um, and instead of using the hand sanitizer, because the, the C. diff bacteria, like it is so strong <laughs> so that it is like, it's got a will to live beyond all reproach that um, they, um, uh, we have to wash our hands with soap and water instead. It's the only way to kill the spores. They're uh, as weird as this sounds, because some this can be caused by antibiotics. In order to treat it, we have to give a special antibiotic. We usually have to give um, metronidazole. Ah, I think I got it, which is flagyl. I'm probably saying it wrong still, but I'm gonna just go with the go with the flow. Um, but usually the treatment I've seen given more often is vancomycin. It can be given oral or sometimes rectally too. Sometimes we give it via enema, and then they also can require what's called I'm not required, but they can um, get improvement with a fecal transplant, which means that someone actually donates their stool and it kind of um they transmits the healthy bacteria from that person's stool into you now they're not swallowing this don't worry it's an ng too but still sounds disgusting right these are the things people come up i don't know who was sitting around and was like hey maybe let's stick this person's stool into this other person and get better but as a whole sorry more need more water let me get another sip as a whole, keep in mind um, with this patient with C. diff that um, the special isolation precautions, um, you want to make sure you have your gown and your gloves on. You don't need any special eye protection stuff unless they're having explosive stool, then be careful, but that's not actually a part of the precautions. Um, be super careful. These patients have to be in a room by themselves and just be careful. Just like, you know, sometimes, you know, you're like, oh, hey, they're not having any stool right now, or I'm not going in. People touch everything in a room. So like, even if you're like, oh, I'm good. Like, you know, like I'm not going, I'm just going in to do something else. Like, trust me, there's spores in that room. So um, be super careful because maybe you can be okay. Maybe you won't get it. Maybe that patient can get better. But if you carry it room to room, it can lead to major problems. All right. That is it for C. diff and diarrhea. I hope this was as illuminating for you as it was for me. See you for the next one.